to start this video, we should understand that all of this revolves around an estate, and the estate does not necessarily relate to land. Here it states a family member or partner of a dissident may make a claim against an estate if they have evidence that the dissident either owed them money or promised them money in exchange for something. A claim against an estate must be defended by the estate representative. There you go, you get claimants and they authenticate the claim and then it's not just about whoever has the strongest claim but rather that claim is recognized or not. So to run an estate you have various mechanisms not just as the one I referenced before, the debt mechanism, but you also have the right by oath. So somebody takes an oath to administer the estate and uh, under the right of that oath, they essentially speaking have the claim against that estate. And this can be found in the Fourth Amendment of the United States, but it states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. No warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath. Now, there's a lot of other ways that this could be done. And the Constitution itself is based around oaths, such as, and with the Declaration of Independence as well. So the whole thing is stipulated around oaths, of which there is more contained in the Constitution but, in fact, in the past, a lot of estates under kings and nobility were administered through oaths. Now, the next significant element to uh, claiming against an estate is that of the right to coronation, or the actual crowning of a king, essentially a separate entity that <coughs> awards the uh, the administration of an estate and therefore they claim right to that estate through that mechanism. Here under Wikipedia, it states coronation is the act of placement or bestowal of a crown upon a monarch's head. The term also generally refers to the ceremony which marks the formal investiture of a monarch with regal power. In addition to the crowning, the ceremony may include the presentation of other items of regalia and other rituals such as taking of special vows, so they have the right by oath. But of course the question is to whom is the oath being sworn? Anyway, by the new monarch, the investing and presentation of regalia, him or her, and acts of homage by the new monarch subjects in certain Christian denominations, such as Lutheranism and Anglicanism, coronation is a religious rite. As such, Western-style coronations have often included anointing the monarch with holy oil, or chrism, as it often is called, christening. christening. The anointing ritual's religious significance follows examples found in the Bible. The monarch's consort male speak crowd either simultaneously with the monarch or as a separate event. So it is very important to notice that this is not just in relation to kings because a lot of people, when they have a child, they have their child christened, and thus that affords a right of claim against the child and the child's estate by those that did the christening, thus forming the evidence as was suggested before, of a claimant to an estate is authenticated through evidence of that claim. Now, the next uh, right, which was referred to in the definition of a claimant to an estate, is that of the debt claim. Here it states, this is a list of countries by government debt, gross government debt, is governmental financial liabilities that are debt instruments. A debt instrument is a financial claim that requires payment of interest and or principal by the debtor to the creditor in the future. Examples include debt securities such as bonds and bills, loans, and government employee pension obligations. Net debt equals gross debt minus financial assets that are debt instruments. Net debt instruments are not always available since some, since, since some government assets are difficult to value, such as loans made as made at concessional rates. Changes in government debt over time reflect primary borrowing due to past government deficits. A deficit occurs when a government expenditures exceed revenues. And now, of course, whoever is supplying that debt then has a has evidence of a claim to the estate. So these concepts are very important for the content in this video. Now, in the Game of Thrones series, the books anyway, and it's somewhat the uh, TV series, it provides an example, uh, an explanation, as it were, of how these claims against the states work and what they're based off of. Here, this is from fandom, gameofthronesfandom.com. 
well, Game of Thrones dot fandom dot com. In the A Song of Fire and Ice novels, the War of the Five Kings is one of the major storylines, which the name first mentioned in the third novel shortly before Joffrey's wedding. Tyrion muses that the struggle that the Maesters are calling the War of the Five Kings is all but at an end. In the TV series, it is first named in dialogue in season two's episode, A Man Without Honor. Well, it is popularly known as the War of the Five Kings. In the fourth novel, an archmaester named Benedict points out that this is somewhat inaccurate, as Balon openly declared himself king of the Iron Islands only slightly after Renly died. So the whole point of this concept is that all of these individuals, they're all, uh, they're all enforcing or attempting to make claims against certain estates in, in the uh, fictional world based off of hereditary right, which is originally based off essentially the use of force. So that's something also that I find a component in these claims is the use of force, claiming based off hereditary right of force used in the past. So that's another element, and naturally claims have to be enforced in order for them to be succeed essentially. So that's very important, and that is something that is made an example of in this series, as well as other types of these claims. Now, also in the Game of Thrones, the religious orders, essentially speaking, make a claim against the throne through the rite of coronation. And here we find this with the character the High Sparrow, sent in by the Fool Moon Boy after his election to High Septon, is a leading member of the Sparrows, a sect of the Faith of the Seven. A Septon's real name is unknown. In the television adaptation, Game of Thrones, the High Sparrow is portrayed by Jonathan Price. Next is the claim against an estate based off of debt. And here we find this also in the Game of Thrones with the Iron Bank of Bravos is a financial institution based in the free city of Bravos that dates back several thousand years. It is considered to be the most established powerful bank in the known world. Now the series cuts off before we find the Iron Bank making its claim against the throne based off of uh, funding the wars that originally installed the kings in the first place. So now we come to the idea of a Marquess or Marquis is a nobleman of high hereditary rank in various European peerages and in those of some of their former colonies. The German language equivalent is Margra Margraf or Margrave. A woman with the rank of Marquess or the wife or widow of Marquess is a Marchioness or Marquise. These titles are also used to translate equivalent Asian titles as in the Imperial China and Imperial Japan. This brings us to the idea of the Red Seal ships were Japanese armed merchant sailing ships bound for Southeast Asian ports with red sealed letters patent issued by the early Tokugawa shogunate in the first half of the 17th century between 1600 and 1635. More than 350 Japanese ships went overseas under this permit system. Now it should be noted that this is not technically speaking the permit system that we would think of, but rather they were carrying cargo of the shogunate, of the essentially the military government, under the protection of that government and the letters patent that they're referring to were essentially sealed scrolls made with likely red ink anyway, as is known to be the custom, stamped with some sort of signature seals, like a signet ring. This is the mark. Now that is essentially what a marquee was, or rather the bearer of a mark. Now when it comes to the uh, system of communication as flag sem semaphore, there, the red flag has very particular significance that is mostly not understood today, and that is was used to convey the idea of taking no prisoners. But naturally the um, color red relates to blood and other things, and we notice the correlation here with red sealed ships and with the red flag in flag semaphore here on Wikipedia, it states flag semaphore is a semaphore system conveying information at a distance by means of visual signals. With handheld flags, rods, discs, paddles, or occasionally bare gloved hands. Information is coded by the position of the flags. It is red when the flag is in a fixed position. Semaphores were adopted and widely used with handheld flags replacing the mechanical arms of shutter semaphores. In the maritime world in the 19th century, it is still used during underway replenishment at sea and is a acceptable for emergency communication in daylight or using large wands instead of flags at night. 
And so the red flag communicate many different things in the case of combat. It could include boarding an enemy ship or vessel. It could include sinking the enemy ship or vessel, essentially speaking, taking no prisoners. And it could also relate to fire. Being red is also used for uh, firefighters to denote what they do. And so the red is important, but it's also important for the seals and the marking of paper for authentication, as well as the use by the bearer of the mark for the control of an estate. Now this takes us to the idea of blood rituals. It states a blood ritual is any ritual that involves the intentional release of blood. Some blood rituals involve two or more parties cutting themselves or each other, followed by the consumption of blood. The participants may regard this release or consumption of blood as producing energy, useful sexual healing, or mental stimulus. In other cases, blood is a primary component as a sacrifice or material component for a spell. Now notice when you spell words, you're spelling, right? And it's widely published through movies and TV shows that when you write in blood, it's some sort of cursed thing that you're doing. Blood rituals are practiced by various groups of people, including those with religious or political affiliations. Some of the rituals involving blood have been practiced for many centuries and are still being practiced in the 21st century. Blood rituals often involve a symbolic death and rebirth, as literally literal bodily birth involves bleeding. Blood is typically seen as very powerful and sometimes as unclean. Blood sacrifice is sometimes considered by the practitioners of prayer, ritual, magic, and spell casting to intensify the power of such activities. And now, of course, also this relates to the idea of the mafia cutting their hands and then sealing packs in blood. So there is a theme here which correlates to the idea of red being blood and then red seals having to do with the semaphore of the red flag. Then we have the Bloods, our primarily African-American street gang. It was founded in Los Angeles, California. The gang is widely known for its rivalry with the Crips. It is identified by the red color worn by its members, and particularly gang symbols, including distinctive hand signs. But of course, notice the name Blood, or the Bloods, and they carry red as their color. The Bloods com comprise various subgroups known as sets, among which significant differences exist, such as colors, clothing operations, and political ideas, that may be in open conflict with each other since the gang's creation has branched throughout the United States. And this brings us to the idea of biometric signatures, of which the use of blood in signing is a biometric component. It's a biometric signature, as it were. And then you, of course, have the idea of pricking the finger and placing a thumbprint. But biometric Signature relates to anything that is um, essentially part of biology, as it were. Biometric signature is analyzing and recording people's physical characteristics. These in characteristics are encrypted, stored securely, and embedded in the signed document. Biometric data is unique to every individual and therefore is used to identify an individual as well as link a particular document or data to him, such as the Red Seal ships or letters of mark as it's stated before, letters patent. And so we find that a lot of the methods of authentication we use today are in fact derived from very old means of doing the same thing. Here we get an example of some biometric signatures, or at least how some of it's used today. Before you can enable fingerprint, so fingerprint is a biometric signature, and then like I just said earlier, uh, pricking the finger and then uh, placing the thumb down makes a fingerprint in blood. So you have two signatures there. You have the blood type of the person as well as the signature of the thumbprint, which is unique to every individual. Or facial recognition. You need to create a pin to sign into Windows. To do this in Windows 10, go to Settings, Account, Sign in Options, select Windows, blah, blah, blah. So, yes, we do, in fact, use these authentication methods, but perhaps not the way they were used once and not to the extent where uh, authentication can be very difficult to, um, to counterfeit. And here we find the doing away with of protections on authentication. Here it states, the law governing the legality of electronic signatures in the U.S. is the eSign Act, which was passed in 2000. 
It was brought in to address the digitizing of business and document processes. The law gave eager signatures the same legal status as written signatures. So that's a big one right there. This means electronic signatures may be used as evidence in court. They can also establish other laws that require signature or signatures, documents that are electronically signed or protected and legally required to be enforced in court. And thus, that will provide evidence for claims against the states. And a, it will open the door to a very particular element in that case. This allows for the signing by something called algorithmic entities, which of course naturally would not have biometric signatures. Academics and politicians have been discussing over the last few years whether it is possible to have a legal algorithmic entity, meaning that an algorithm, or AI, is granted legal personhood. In most countries, the law only recognizes natural or real persons and legal persons. The main argument is that behind every legal person or layers of legal persons, there is eventually a natural person. Now, this, of course, has already been done because you have companies and organizations that can sign for themselves without, essentially speaking, a human representative. So they did away with that. Now the foundational understanding of these claims against the state uh, can be found from a book called The Great Ship from Amicon, Annals of Macau and the Old Japan Trade, 1555-1640. Now this book is copyrighted uh, 1959 at Lisboa or Lisbon, a center of historical ultramarine studies. One complaint was that many Indian merchants at Goa, Kaul, and elsewhere were sending great quantities of merchandise to Macau through Portuguese traders who passed them through the local customs as their own property, thus evading payment of the full duties and defrauding the crown. The captain majors of the Japan voyage were repeatedly accused of abusing their privilege, their privileges, by illegally borrowing money from the estates of orphans and deceased persons at Macau and elsewhere. Legislation was also passed prohibiting the captain majors from wintering over long in Japan or from staying in Macau during the monsoon when they should have been at Nagasaki. There we get in mention of the old practice of buying, of borrowing, and of managing the estates of orphans and deceased people in a fraudulent manner, essentially. So now we get a good understanding of what a gravestone is or a marker. Here under Wikipedia, a gravestone or tombstone is a marker, usually stone, that is placed over a grave. A marker set at the head of the grave may be called a headstone, an especially old or elaborate stone slab may be called a funeral stele, stele, or slab. The use of such markers is traditional for Chinese, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic burials, as well as in other traditions. In East Asia, the tomb's spiritual tablet is a focus for ancestral veneration and may be removed may be removable for greater protection between rituals. Ancient grave markers typically incorporated funerary art, especially details in stone relief. With greater literacy, more markers began to include inscriptions of the deceased's name, date of birth, and date of death. Often along with a personal message of prayer, the presence of a frame for photographs and deceased is also increasingly common. Of course, those are the things that you would need to essentially fill out paperwork to have to, to that relate to that person's estates and managing of them, and the grave marker bears the mark, right, the mark of the individual in stone. And this all has to do with control of the estate. So there's a variety of ways that they took control over estates, and our first example of how they do this is from the state of Pennsylvania, Lunacy Law of 1883, and then got a very long description, and this is copyright 1907, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Here it states, uh, it's a very long document, so I don't quite remember where it is, but it's page 20. It states, upon the day fixed for the hearing, the court shall require the presence of the person against whom the petition is presented, unless there is positive testimony to the effect that such person cannot be brought into court with safety to him or herself. At such hearing, the court shall take the testimony of all parties of an interest and of such other witnesses as the petitioner and the person against whom proceedings are instituted or any member of his or her family, he or she may sit, see fit to summon on the question of the inability of the person against whom the proceedings are taken to care for his or her property because of mental deficiency. So that's a big one right there. Reg render somebody mentally deficient.
If the court on such hearing shall be satisfied that the person against whom the proceedings are taken is not able, owing to insanity or weakness of mind, to take care of his or her property, then it shall be the duty of the court to decide and enter a decree accordingly and appoint a guardian to take care of the same. Now, the guardian does not have to be an individual. It could be a corporation. If the person against whom the proceedings are taken shall demand in writing prior to the decision of the court on such application trial by jury, it shall thereupon be the duty of the said court to award an issue, framed to determine the question of fact involved in such trial shall be granted. From and after a decree that the person against whom the same is entered is insane or so weak in mind that he or she is unable to take care of his or her property, said person shall be wholly incapable of making any contract or gift whatever or an instrument in writing, and the entry of such decree shall be notice of such incapacity, and a uh, said person shall be ward of the court appointing such guardian. So there you have your authentication of the claim against the estate. The guardian so appointed shall have precisely the same powers and be subject to the same duties as a committee on lunacy in the state of Pennsylvania. The court appointing such Guardian shall have full power over the same in directing and allowing or allowance for the said ward and for the support and maintenance of his wife or his or her children and the education of his or her minor children and shall enter a decree of sale, mortgaging, leasing or conveyance upon ground rent of the real estate or any part thereof of the said ward whenever in the opinion of the court it is necessary for the support and maintenance of the said ward or his family or the education of his or her minor children the payment of his or her debts or where it is for the interest and advantage of the said ward that the same shall be sold, mortgage, leased, or let on ground rent, and all absolute sales in fee simple except as hereinafter provided shall be a public sale or vendue and may be either entirely for cash or partly on credit and after full advertisement for at least 20 days of handbills posted in at least 20 of the most public places in the city or county where the said premises shall be situated and in at least two newspapers not less than three times in each provided that if the court shall be of the opinion that under the circumstances a better price can be obtained by private sale than a public sale the court may decree and approve the same okay so to unravel this here this is essentially the idea is borrowing against the uh, estates of deceased people or orphans now, they do this by rendering our ancestors essentially mentally defective. And then we, through being related in, or to them, we are endlessly going to be have our estates administered based off these old rulings. And also, the estates are sold off as estates can be, but is most likely done, sold at private sale, to other claimants. So we're going to get into that in a minute. Now, another way this done is done is found in the General Code of the State of Ohio, also with a long description. This is uh, Volume 2. Uh, Cincinnati, the Law Book Publishers, the W.H. Anderson Company, copyright 1910. Here it states, all property within the jurisdiction of the state and any interest therein, whether belonging to inhabitants of the state or not, and whether tangible or intangible, which passed by will or by the intestate laws of this state, or by deed, grant, sale, gift made, or intended to take effect in possession or enjoyment after the death of the grantor to a person in trust or otherwise other than to, or for the use of the father, mother, husband, wife, brother, sister, niece, nephew, lineal descendant, adopted child, or person recognized as an adopted child and made a legal heir under the provisions of a statute of the state. Of course, there they leave the door open for exactly what they're planning on doing. Or the lineal descendants thereof, or the lineal descendants of an adopted child, the wife or widow of a son, the husband of the daughter of a decedent, shall be liable to a tax of 5% for its value above the sum of $200. Now notice, of course, the word there, decedent, as relates to the claim, the claimant definition that we saw first. 75% of such tax shall be for the use of the estate and 25% for the use of the county wherein it's collected. All administrators, executors, and trustees and any such grantee under a conveyance made during the grantor's life shall be liable for such taxes with lawful interests as here and after provided until they have been paid. As here and after directed, such taxes shall become due and payable immediately upon the death of the dissident and shall at once become a lien upon the property and be and remain a lien until paid. So this is, of course, part of their schemes that relate to the ability to borrow against the estates of dead people. 
and orphans. But it's more than that. It's also about taking control based off of authenticated claims, mostly fraudulent, but either way authenticated, so that they can take over that property or estates, which also include minor children and also family members. The control of their the ability to control that estate, essentially speaking, takes the mark, control of the mark, the mark of the estate. And if you're if they don't get it through the lunacy crap, then they're going to get it through this bogus inheritance tax stuff by placing liens on the property or the estate, right? Not just land property, because we only mostly understand property as meaning land but rather the whole estate, including children, and they take control of that through this mechanism. So now we come to our first example of how this essentially plays out today. And we're going to start with the grave marker Carrie E. Phillips Rising, allegedly born in 1858 and died in 1930. And the uh, grave marker allegedly is in Ticonderoga, Essex County, New York. Now, there's a place called Rising Park, and here it states July 5th, 1909. Rising Park was originally dedicated July 5th, 1909, following the gift of 73 acres from Philip and Carrie E. Rising to the city of Lancaster to be managed and used as a free public park for our citizens forever. So there you get your first instance of this control of the estate on behalf of an alleged heir. Or claim it. Now, here's the park. <laughs> it's a pretty interesting piece of land and is right next to the Fairfield County Fairgrounds. That's definitely no accident. And there's some interesting correlations here. But either way, it is prime real estate <clears throat> and something that would want to be taken out of the hands or control of any single individual or rather a public entity but rather put into the incorporation of the private uh, juridical entity that is the city of Lancaster, Ohio. However, this, uh, this estate based allegedly off of a gift as though we haven't seen that one before um, <clears throat> by the apparent uh, rising family. Well, um, well, there will be pattern here. So let's uh, look at that. Here we have about Rise Realty Company. At Rise Realty, we truly do hustle with heart. Mm. Considering ourselves go-givers, Rather than go-getters, it is not simply about getting a sale, listing our buyers and sellers. It is about giving, giving our time, attention, counsel, education, empathy, and most importantly, value. So there's a bunch of give there, and also they uh, have to do with real estate. Go figure. Then we have the Rise Fund. The RISE funds invest in companies driving measurable social and environmental impact alongside business performance and strong returns. That sounds like funding uh, takeover. With $19 billion of assets under management across the RISE funds, TPG RISE Climate and the Evercare Health Fund, TPG's impact investing funds, work with growth stage high potential mission-driven companies that have the power to change the world. There's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of empty words there, but they do actually mean something. They are funding takeovers, essentially. And this is headquartered in San Francisco. The Rise Fund was founded in 2016 by TPG in partnership with Bono and Jeff Skoll and offers deep expertise in business solutions to help achieve the United Nations sustainable development goals. So there you go. Internationalist occupation. Next, we have the Rise Family Services, LLC, offers a person-centered approach to our services. We understand that each of our clients' needs differ, thus we must utilize an approach that can cater to their diverse needs. For this reason, we use innovative and evidence-based treatment interventions. With these as our base, we work with our clients and endeavor together to create positive changes and improve their quality of life, blah, blah, blah. And this is out of... 
Maryland, I believe. But that's another uh, entity that would link to the so-called Rise family estate, as it were. Next, we have the Rise Global Foundation, the Rise Community Fund supported by the National Broadband Ireland and Granahan McCourt is aimed at addressing the rural digital divide and will award five monthly grants of 1,000 euro each to empower local businesses, community groups, farms, and social enterprises to enhance their digital strategy. So here, of course, we see what they're focusing on, considering this particular Rise entity and the Rise funds from out of California. They have a very universal scope focus. Each of them focuses differently, each of the entities anyway, but it's all around the same overall strategy. Then we have the Rise Foundation. The Rise Foundation currently runs non-residential family programs in Dublin City and occasionally in a number of counties around Ireland and a one-to-one -one counseling service in Dublin City with a team of experienced addiction counselors provide individual and group counseling services to people adversely affected by a loved one's addiction. These services are available to people from all communities throughout the island of Ireland. So now this is the last part of our rise, rise chain as an example. And it is very apparent what they're doing. They're attempting to take things from individuals by rendering them, rendering them mentally defective, as we've seen. So they have these groups out here whose job is to go around to provide counseling, as we see here, and also to uh, assist with mental health. Naturally speaking, that relates to the idea of being able to administer the estates of those that are mentally defective. Thus you find, and then of course they use that and leverage that estate that they've taken to then acquire other estates. And of course we see that played out here. So the person does not have to be real. We see this with the Nigerian print scam, which rather than believing what they say, which is that the Nigerian print scam works and that many people fall for it, rather we recognize it as a false individual, as a juridical entity, pretending to be a individual, of course, which you can authenticate, but I mean, why would you want to authenticate something that's clearly a scam? Well, here's the reason why. Because there are Nigerian Prince funds, which are laundering the revenue that comes from a state. Right, that's a big one. The laundering of revenue from a state. Now, the laundering of an estate itself is a little bit more difficult than just the revenue. The revenue is probably one of the easier components to launder. However, the actual laundering of estate is much more difficult, but this can be done if the estate was lost in a scam. On the other hand, when you have revenue that's lost in a scam, you usually can't get that back, especially when it's a lot of money, it has to do with some investment vehicle or whatnot. If you lose real estate to a scam, well, then what happens there? Not sure most people know. And I don't truly know either what happens to real estate if it gets lost in the scam. Either way, most of these are in fact scams and that's exactly what happened. So let's go ahead and look at some examples of scams that we are not taught are scams, but essentially speaking, were ways to acquire estates and land, large quantities of land under false pretense. This starts with something for some buddies called the Heirs of Lafayette. Now this is a court case called the Heirs of General Lafayette v. Kenton. And this is the United States Supreme Court, 59 U.S. 197. Now one thing that we should recognize here is that the U.S. Supreme Court that is presiding over this case is not anything related to the actual Constitution of the United States because the United States Supreme Court that we have today is essentially speaking the U.S. Code Court from the U.S. Code of Government and it was established much, much later when this territory was then occupied by foreign interests. So that's something that's really important to note that 
the United States Supreme Court is itself fraudulent. And so them presiding over a fraudulent case that has no basis in reality is not outside of their wheelhouse. So these cases are brought up by writ of error from the Circuit Court of the United States for the Eastern District of Louisiana. They are argued by Mr. Taylor for the plaintiffs in error and Mr. Benjamin, Mr. Janine for defendants. The arguments of counsel were so connected with the maps which were produced in court that it would be difficult to present the reader a clear explanation of them without the map. Mr. Justice Coutron delivered the opinion of the court. Now, many, of course, who are naysayers, when you show them things like this, they will say, well, why would anyone do that? And the answer is simple. Authentication of the claim. So here we come to the House of Lafayette. More authentications to the claim, of course, and this is Wikipedia. The House of Lafayette was a French family of nobles of the sword from the province of Auvergne. Established during the Middle Ages by the Lords of the Fife of Lafayette, held by the senior branch of the Motier family. So it was allegedly founded in the 12th century in the Kingdom of France. And of course, we've never seen, you know, royal houses uh, completely fabricated where the uh, evidence of their existence is, doesn't add up. <laughs> that couldn't happen, right? So here's something that we'll see a lot is that often. The titles to estates and the value of, of the estate itself, anything that's in it, including, of course, the family members, the children and all that, often goes through the wife. And we noticed in the uh, mental deficiency ruling that the guardian was able to administer states not just on behalf of of the defect, mentally defective individual, but their wife and all subsequent heirs, their children, minor children, etc. The guardian was able to administer those. And that's the reason why we see this pattern here of things going through the female. And essentially speaking, that is how you launder estates. It's a little bit different than laundering money because in order to lose the estate, it has to go through the woman where the name is then lost and it essentially gets laundered through many layers of different heirs with changing names and whatnot because it always goes through the woman who according to those edicts on mentally defective um, people rendered mentally defective which had to be men essentially the wife was going to be uh, included in the estate that was to be administered by the guardian so here we have Mary Adrienne and Francois de Noël, Marquis de Lafayette. Marquis, we've just established, means mark bearer. Was a French marchioness. She was the daughter of Jean de Noël and Henriette Anne Louise de Agusou. In 1774, she married Gilbert du Montier, Marquis de Lafayette. Again, Marquis is bearer of the mark of the estate who left France in 1776 to volunteer in the American Revolutionary War, where he served under General George Washington, then later became a key figure in the French Revolution in 1789. Yeah, this is a very common practice, is the invention of a false character who you can pretty much instantly comprehend was not a real, uh, real individual in most fictional circumstances, because usually they don't have any effect on the story. However, in this context, we are completely lied to about the War for Independence. The American Revolutionary War is a fictitional, fictitious account of the War for Independence and the one that they focus on instead of the American War for Independence, the real event versus the American Revolution, their fiction. So here we've got the profile, the, again, authentication of the claim. Marie-Joseph Paul Yves Roque. Hubert du Montier de Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette. It's interesting how that name is really long, but his wife's name is relatively short. Born allegedly 6 September 1757, died 20th May 1834, known in the United States as Lafayette. Was a French nobleman and military officer who volunteered to join the Continental Army, which there was no Continental Army, led by General George Washington. Again, there wasn't a Continental Army, so there wouldn't have been a general of the Continental Army. In the American Revolutionary War, Lafayette was ultimately permitted to command Continental Army troops in the decisive siege of Yorktown in 1781. 
The Revolutionary War's final major battle that secured American independence after returning to France, Lafayette became a key figure in the French Revolution of 1789 and the July Revolution of 1830 and continues to be celebrated as here in both France and in the United States. Now, it's possible that you'll be able to find documentation proving this stuff. However, a lot of that documentation, through forensic evidence, will likely be found to be fraudulent because it was written later. And those things can easily be found through stuff like uh, word usage, patterns of language, and all these other things They slip through the cracks when somebody at a later date is attempting to forge a document that they want to appear as having an old character to it. And no forger is perfect, even though some might be better than others. Then we have George Washington Louise Gilbert de Lafayette was the son of Gilbert de Montier, Marquis de Lafayette, the French officer and hero of the American Revolution, and Adrien de Lafayette. He was named in honor of George Washington, under whom his father served in the Revolutionary War. So this provides another piece that in order to understand how these things work, you also have to understand the implications of a false personage naming their son after an alleged uh, a real figure, is that because this person's name is George Washington, that can be used to make claims against things like a George Washington fund, George Washington estate, those types of things. It just, of course, comes down to which George Washington are you talking about? of which there could be many George Washingtons. That's uh, something that we're usually not trained to think about because, in fact, there are usually are many of one person. Now, we come to the implications to the estate for the claim of Lafayette. Honors and memorials to the Marquis of Lafayette. And, of course, this is our our evidence of how the estates were stolen under that mentally defective thing, and then they were re-moved over to this false claim because the guardians were determining that the claim was legitimate. With nothing else, and of course they were usually involved in some sort of secret society or some other type of uh, behind-closed-doors do um contracts and agreements. Anyway, uh, this just says what we saw, read before about the so-called Marquis de Lafayette, or the bearer of the mark of Lafayette, Gilbert du Montier. So here we have the cities and towns. We've got Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fayetteville, Georgia, LaGrange, Georgia, I don't know why LaGrange is included with Lafayette. But I have done some work on LaGrange. LaGrange is, of course, a, a secret society that relates to agriculture, part of the Masons, I believe. Fayetteville, New York, Lafayette, Alabama, Fayetteville, Tennessee, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Lafayette, California, Lafayette, Georgia, Lafayette, Oregon, Lafayette, Indiana, Lafayette, Louisiana, Lafayette, New York, and LaGrange, New York. Then out of places, we've got Fayette County, Alabama, Fayette County, Georgia, Fayette County, Kentucky, Fayette County, Tennessee, Fayette County, Pennsylvania, Fayette County, West Virginia, Fayette County, Arkansas, Fayette County, Mississippi, Fayette County, Florida, and Fayette Parish, Louisiana. Other places, we've got Mount Lafayette in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, Lafayetteville in Milan, New York, Lafayette Park and neighborhood in Fall River, Massachusetts, Lafayette Park, a park in Watkins Glen, New York, LaGrange, Georgia, named for Lafayette's estate in France. We already read that before. Lafayette Park in San Francisco, California. Squares, we have Lafayette Square in Buffalo, New York, where he spoke during his nationwide tour in 1825. Yeah, right. Lafayette Square in St. Louis, Missouri, created in 1833 as one of his first public parks. Lafayette Square, Washington, D.C., Lafayette Square, New Orleans, Louisiana, Lafayette Square in LaGrange, Georgia. Next, we have Ulysse Lafayette in Almu, Czech Republic, Lafayette Street in Metamora, Illinois, Illinois, Lafayette Drive in Lafayette Road in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, Lafayette Boulevard in Fredericksburg, Virginia, 
and Lafayette Street in Marion, Florida, and Lafayette Street in Lansburg, Virginia. Next, we have schools, Lafayette High School, Alabama, Lafayette High School, Georgia, Lafayette High School, Florida, Lafayette High School, Lexington, Kentucky, Lafayette High School, Louisiana, Lafayette High School, St. Joseph, Missouri, Lafayette High School, Wildwood, Missouri, Lafayette High School, New York City, Lafayette High School, Buffalo, New York, Lafayette High School, Virginia, and Lafayette Junior and Senior High School, Lafayette, New York. Now, streets, we've got Rue Lafayette, <coughs> Lafayette Street, New Haven, Connecticut, Lafayette Street, Wilson Park, New York, New York City, Lafayette Avenue in Brooklyn, Lafayette Avenue in the Bronx, Lafayette Street in Manhattan, Lafayette Street in Queens, and Lafayette Street in Staten Island, Lafayette Road in New Hampshire, uh, La Avenue de Lafayette in Boston, Lafayette Avenue in Baltimore, Lafayette a Boulevard in Bridgeport, Lafayette Road in Harrington Park, Lafayette Road in Indianapolis, Lafayette Street in Cape May, Lafayette Street in Waltham, Massachusetts. Now next in this chain with Lafayette, we look at Jane Dickerson Mercer. Now notice, born 1794 in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. So this is definitely going to relate to the so-called estate of the heirs of Lafayette. Next we have Aaron Mercer. Frederick County, Virginia, born 20th of February, 1792. Again, Frederick County, Virginia. Now, for this person, of which it's allegedly the husband of the other person, we should notice the name or the place being Virginia as birth while the other person was Pennsylvania. Now we have Asa, Mercer, Asa Shin Mercer was the first president of the Territorial University of Washington and a member of the Washington State Senate. He is remembered primarily for his role in three milestones of the old American West, the founding of the University of Washington, the Mercer Girls in the Johnson County War, Mercer Island and Lake Washington, and Mercer Street in Street, Seattle are named not for Asa, but rather his brother Thomas. Seattle Public Schools operates Asa Mercer International Middle School in Seattle's Beacon Hill neighborhood. Let's go ahead and look at that school. The Ace of Mercer International Middle School. Mercer International Middle School is located in the diverse Beacon Hill community. Our school is home to families from all over the world. We are an international community of learners opening a door to the world. At Mercer, every student is a reader, writer, mathematician, scientist, and thinker. Our mission, we are an international community of learners open door to the world. At Mercer, every student is a reader, writer, mathematician, blah, blah, blah. And it's actually just repeated the same thing that we read before, which is interesting because that's like copy and paste, right? Also, please notice the international bend, which relates to the so-called RISE uh, funds, foundations, um, mental health, state thieves, and the uh, gifting, of course, of uh, prime real estate, which they can leverage, of course, to acquire other states, you know, giving out um, false dubious loans and things like that. So it is very important to notice that these, most of these things, based off of false pretense and, of course, fake people and fake claimants, are all done around the interests of internationalist occupation. So, under the canceling team, we notice that there is Virginia Andrews. Now, where exactly was the husband born? <coughs> Fredericksburg, Virginia. So now we come to Judge Thomas Mercer, was a pioneer associated with the early history of Seattle. Seattle, Mercer Street, and Mercer Island in Lake Washington bear his name. Mercer born was in, born, Mercer was born in Harrison County, Ohio on March 11, 1813, and was the eldest son of Aaron and Jane Dickerson Mercer, themselves born in Virginia and Pennsylvania, respectively. Aaron Mercer moved to Ohio in boyhood, being among the pioneers of that country. He learned the process of manufacturing woolen cloths and blankets and then operated his own factory very successfully for a number of years. Yeah, I highly doubt any of that. Now, Mercer Island is a city in King County, Washington, United States, located on an island of the same name in the southern portion of Lake Washington. Mercer Island is in the Seattle metropolitan area, with Seattle to its west and Bellevue to its east. Island is connected to the mainland on both sides by bridges carrying Interstate 90 with the city of Seattle to the west, the city of Bellevue to the east, blah, blah, blah. So those are interesting names. King County for Mercer Island, Washington. 
Now we have the Mercer Family Foundation is a private grant making foundation in the United States. As of 2013, it had 37 million in assets. As we know, grants are a very effective vehicle to take things over and to conquer and occupy. The foundation is run by Rebecca Mercer, the daughter of computer scientists and head fund manager Robert Mercer. And like I said before, most of this stuff goes through the females and the uh, in the mix-up, right? Not not the males. It transfers through the females. You might have a male who controls the mark, but it will always go through a female, which relates, of course, to that uh, act on uh, mental deficiency and the ability to take over an estate. Under Rebecca's leadership, the Family Foundation invested about $70 million into conservative causes between 2009 and 2014. The foundation is also donated to groups critical of climate change activism. Now, Robert Leroy Mercer is an American hedge fund manager, computer scientist, and political donor. Mercer was an early artificial intelligence researcher and developer and is the former C co-CEO of the hedge fund company Renaissance Technologies. Mercer played a controversial role in the campaign for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union, led by Dominic Cumming, with £3.9 million pounds sterling being spent on his data analytics and machine learning company Aggregate IQ. He also he has also been a major funder of organizations supporting right-wing political causes in the United States, such as Breitbart News, now defunct Cambridge Analytica, and Donald Trump's 2016 campaign for president. He is the principal benefactor of the Make America Number One Super PAC. So a lot of people who tend to lean towards the so-called other side of the aisle, they wouldn't want to believe this type of thing, whereas the other side would instantly jump on it. <clears throat> now, either side of brainwashed followers is not really the point of this content here. This individual is not real, and none of the other individuals that we have read about are real. They're all fake. Now, a lot of these groups out there who might have started out one way or the other with certain intentions, they get taken over and their estates get stolen. And this is one of the ways that they do it. Grants, debt instruments, the ruling of mentally defectiveness, and imposing liens on the estates are all ways to claim them and to take them over. And so this is one reason why you might start following a certain group, but then that group seems to suddenly change. That's because they took a grant from someone like Robert Leroy Mercer, a fictitious entity. Now we have the next uh, example here, of which we have three. So first we looked at the Rise family estates. Then we looked at the heirs of Lafayette estates, which linked to the Mercers. Now we're going to look at the estates of Bonaparte. Here, under Wikipedia, the House of Bonaparte is a former imperial and royal European dynasty of Italian origin. It was founded in 1804 by Napoleon I, son of Corsican nobleman Ca Carlo Bonaparte and Letizia Bonaparte, ni Roma Ramolino. Napoleon was a French military leader who rose to power during the French Revolution, and who in 1804 transformed the first French First Republic into the First French Empire five years after his coup d'état of November 1799, 18 Brumier. Napoleon, or Brumier. Napoleon and the Grand Armée had to fight against every major European power except for the ones he was allied with, including Denmark and Norway, and dominated continental Europe through a series of military victories during the Napoleonic Wars. He installed members of his family on the thrones of client states, expanding the power of the dynasty. So there's a couple things to notice here. First of all, the birth in Corsica. That seems very unlikely that you'll have a general who was born in Corsica, of all places, with the link to a minor noble family. There's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, for one, Corsica is, uh, speaks Italian and would relate to the claims of the Vatican. Also, the Vatican claims uh, ownership over the kingdoms of Europe based off of right to coronation, <clears throat> as well as many other things. In addition, Corsica is such a weird and um, unlikely place that somebody is going to look into that it would be very hard to even validate many of these claims, even though they have all this authentication around it. It's highly unlikely, but it's not about the unlikelihood of something, because they authenticate unlikely things all the time, and then people believe it because it's been authenticated. 
Now, in addition, we notice that the the heirs of Napoleon, essentially speaking, include all royalty throughout Europe. That's no accident. And this, just like the other examples, are frauds. This, these heirs of Bonaparte, just like those of Lafayette, were never real. So here's the alleged uh, main heir of Bonaparte. Jean-Christophe, Prince Napoleon, Prince of Montfort, or Jean-Christophe Louis Ferdinand Albert, Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, isn't that nice? Somebody has fun writing up these profiles. Uh, 11 July 1986, France is a disputed head of the Imperial House of France, and as such, the heir of Napoleon Bonaparte, the first emperor of the French. He would be known as Napoleon the Seventh. A graduate of HEC Paris and Harvard Business School, he pursued a career in private equity, gaining experience at Morgan Stanley and Blackstone in both New York City and London. Later, he founded Leon Capital, a private equity investment firm. <coughs> now, Leon Black, of course, is a very a particularly uh, creepy individual, if that person does in fact exist. Well, but it's very easy to put all these accolades onto somebody who isn't real because a real person generally has difficulty getting accolades like this. Now this brings us to the J.N. and Macy Edens Foundation out of Texas. Mission. Joseph Napoleon Paul Edens and Lilac Macy Edens were longtime residents of Corsicana, Texas. This stuff couldn't be more obvious. Joseph was a self-made man who, from a young age, managed the family ranch. For years, Miss Mr. Edens bred Herefords, winning numerous prizes throughout the nation. Mr. Edens later became bank president of the Corsicana First National Bank. Well, isn't that weird? Going from a rancher to a bank owner. Well, president, anyway. Mr. Edens started forage clubs and Future Farmers of America chapters, where his influence is still present today. Mr. and Miss Edens had a strong sense of community and established the J.N. and Macy Edens Foundation to promote the well-being of mankind. Yes, yeah, so that's all about state laundering from the heirs of Bonaparte. Now we have the Lucian Bonaparte Fund, which this one's pretty... Uh... Well, it doesn't say very much. <laughs> so all of this stuff is based off the idea of the Markov chain or Markov process. This is also the thing that's behind the idea of automation, of which the majority of these fictitious estate laundering schemes are automated. So if somebody is going to, uh, say, make a claim against any of these estates or the funds or whatnot, well, then they'll submit a claim to the fund or foundation, and they'll have a particular process on how to do that. And the things are going to be automated. So that means somebody could come along and correctly authenticate their claim, whether or not they're with a particular group or not. It's all done in the name of. I guarantee no individual can do this. Only juridical entities can, i.e. companies, associations, those types of things. These internationalist people hate individuals and human beings. So it's logical to assume that they would not want individuals making claims against the estate. So the only ways to make claims against these estate are as juridic entities or as fictitious individuals who have never existed. So in, the, in essence, the way to authenticate your legitimacy of claim is to, in fact, create fraud. Because the way that they look at it is fraud is legitimate and legitimate is fraudulent. So, this in Wikipedia, Markov chain or Markov process is the stochastic model describing a sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event depends only on the state attained in the previous event. Informally, this may be thought of as what happens next depends only on the state of affairs now. Countably infinite sequence in which the chain moves out, moves state at discrete time steps, gives a discrete time Markov chain, DTMC. A continuous time process is called a continuous time Markov chain, CTMC. 
Markov processes are named in honor of the Russian mathematician Andrei Markov, who probably also didn't exist. Markov chains have many applications as statistical models of real-world processes. They provide the basis for general stochastic simulation methods known as Markov chain Monte Carlo, which are used for simulating sampling from complex probability distributions and have found an application in areas including Bayesian statistics, biology, chemistry, economics, finance, information theory, physics, signal processing, speech processing. So yes, we see that a lot of this has to do with the way things are run today, but the biggest one for this video is the fact that this is incorporated into finance. <clears throat> so it is important to know as a warning that a incorrectly authenticated request, especially one based off an individual who exists, which they hate, or a human being, is that there are likely fail safes or triggers that one can run afoul of if they don't do their homework and they don't file correctly with these estates. Essentially speaking, that will be evidence to the automated system of an attack or assault upon the estate. And in this case, they would implement a scorched earth policy, according to Wikipedia, is a military strategy of destroying everything that allows an enemy military force to be able to fight a war, including deprivation and destruction of water, food, humans, animals, plants, and any kind of tools and infrastructure. Its use is possible by, re by a retreating army to leave nothing of value worth taking, to weaken the attacking force, or by an advancing army to fight against unconventional warfare. Scorched earth against non-combatants has been banned under the 1977 Geneva Convention. Yeah, who gives a crap? The Geneva Conventions don't mean anything. And they never have. However, what's important here is the concept of scorched earth tactics. If somebody files a claim against the state and it is not done correctly, considering the systems are automated and they don't trust individuals, then, logically, things might happen, like, say, wildfires in California or Lahaina, with the intent of this idea, rendering nothing of value left to the enemy. Now, another thing that could happen is that the funds in an estate are suddenly moved somewhere else. They just disappear. They get laundered through a series of other funding mechanisms. And there's many other things like that. And it's very interesting to think about how that would work in regard to children. Now this correlates to the Jesuit mission of Go Set the World on Fire. For all those animated by the Jesuit vision, ministry is an adventure. Our founder, Ignatius Loyola, captured the spirit when he sent his good friend, Francis Xavier, on a mission to the Far East. Ignatius told him, Go Set the World on Fire. So the Society of Jesus, or Jesuits, also known as the Jesuit Order of, or the Jesuits, is a religious order of clerics, regular of, or of pontific, pontifical right for men in the Catholic Church headquartered in Rome. Now it's interesting about that symbol that we looked at with the Jesuit sun, is that it correlates to the House of Baratheon of Dragonstone from the Game of Thrones. Lord Stannis Baratheon is at first to suspect that Queen Cersei Lannister's children are not also those of King Robert I Baratheon. Of course, that's the reason for him claiming the throne, his authentication of the claim. However, he takes the symbol of a flaming heart with a stag in the middle. So, this relates to the Lord of Light, also known as the Red God, Ralor, the Heart of Fire, and the God of Flame and Shadow, as a deity widely worshipped in the continent of Essos. The Lord of Light has been described as fire god and its clergy fire priests, as his worship centers around fire and light. The faith of the Lord of Light is the majority religion in several of the free cities, most notably Bravos, Mir, Lys, and Volantis, and extends to Ashai in the distant east. Worship of the Lord of Light is almost unheard of in Westeros. Now, it's very interesting that they are fire priests, and that the mission of the Jesuits is to go set the world on fire. This also relates to the so-called most sacred heart of Jesus is one of the most widely practiced and well-known Catholic devotions, wherein the heart of Jesus Christ is viewed as a symbol of God's boundless and passionate love for mankind. And when we look at the symbol of the heart, there's a striking resemblance to a particular other symbol from Game of Thrones, doesn't it? 